hockey memorabilia for our celebration next month. Uh, high years of hockey play. So if you have any old skates, hockey pucks, uniforms, uh, pictures, or stories, we'd love to uh, have them out here on low, put on display for our celebration. Thank you. Okay, Jay, sorry. Sit right up here. Well, good afternoon. Uh, you are the hardy people coming out on a cold day like this uh, to hear about the Welsh of central New York. Um, Going to give a, a little overview about who the Welsh are, about Welsh immigration to the United States, and uh, some general information about the Welsh uh, in central New York. Uh, a number of years ago, I was asked to do a talk on the Welsh of Central New York uh, for the Historical Society, back when the Historical Society met in the library. Uh, and at that time, uh, I had, uh, I really didn't have much information on the Welsh of the area, so I set out looking for uh, where we could find uh, information. And as I did that, I got obsessed and uh, turned it all into a book. Uh, I will not bore you with all of the various places in central New York which you have to do with the Welsh. Uh, I, we'll have some pictures later of some of the buildings which are standing associated with Welsh chapels. Uh, but as you drive around central New York, there are numerous cemeteries uh, and numerous other uh, buildings and uh, places which are associated with Welsh people who came to central New York. So we'll start off uh, talking a little bit about the Welsh. Now, I know some people over here wearing their Welsh dragon. Uh, they don't probably need to be told about who the Welsh are. Uh, but let me just, for those uh, who are uninitiated in, in those matters, let me just tell you a few things about the Welsh. The Welsh, um, in, the, in, in the Welsh language, they're the Cymri. They are, which means comrades. They are the Celtic people of Britain who were pushed out of their, their land by the English. You can all do it if you want. Uh, the, the, the Welsh were, were pushed, along with other Celtic people, to the sort of the marginal uh, outside areas of Britain, and uh, for many years were considered uh, the foreigners by the English. In fact, Wales comes from the same root uh, as Walnut means foreign nut, and, and, and so uh, the Welsh, it comes from the same root, Wales means the foreigners, and so uh, the Welsh were considered the foreign people. People sort of uh, kept on, on the side, they, they were not uh, really thought of much by the English. Uh, the English uh, attempted to uh, control the Welsh, and if you go to Wales, you'll see all these beautiful castles built by the English, uh, especially uh, Edward I, uh, as a means of subjugating the Welsh. And eventually, when Henry uh, Tudor, uh, or Henry VII, uh, came to power uh, in England and came to the throne, he was from Wales, and there was an act of union bringing uh, the two countries of England and Wales together. With, in a short period of time, uh, the, the English forgot about that act of union and, and continued to think about the Welsh as sort of second-class citizens. Uh, and so there was always a great tension between England and Wales, uh, so much so that uh, there are many Welsh that would like to leave uh, the Wales. Uh, we've heard of uh, William Penn and Pennsylvania. Uh, William Penn uh, was not himself Welsh, but uh, grew up in Wales. Penn uh, is actually a Welsh word, which means top. And I think they were, they, their, their, their ancestral home was at the top or something. So they were called Penn. Uh, and when he got his land in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, as it's now called, uh, he was approached by a number of Welsh Quakers asking to come to uh, settle in the new, new world. And so in the colonial times, you'll see most of the Welsh immigration was to Pennsylvania in an area around Philadelphia, which is called the Welsh Tract. Uh, 
Uh, it, you will see towns there called Radnor, Haverford, St. David's, um, North Wales, places like that all around uh, Philadelphia. Uh, you'll also see a number of towns such as, uh, a number of towns with sound wealth, uh, which were just uh, invented names by English people to make it sound Welsh, uh, to make it seem as though they were part of the Welsh track. Uh, the, the Welsh track had a number of uh, different immigrants there, and I thought maybe at this point tell you a little bit about the religious groups in Wales uh, which came over to the United States. Uh, the, the, first, uh, the first group to come over was actually Baptist. Uh, they founded a, a church in Swansea, Massachusetts. Uh, they were, uh, Baptists were allowed to flourish during the, the time of Cromwell. After the end of the Commonwealth in Britain, uh, Baptists were persecuted, and so they picked up and moved to Swansea, Massachusetts. Uh, later, Baptists moved to the Welsh Tract in Pennsylvania. Uh, Quakers moved to the Welsh Tract in Pennsylvania. There were also a number of people from the established church in Wales, which is an Anglican church. Uh, they also set up churches in the Welsh Tract. Uh, so you'll see a lot of those, uh, those churches in colonial times. Uh, other religious groups, uh, which we'll talk about a little later in uh, coming to the United States, were congregational churches. Uh, they were the, the independents in Wales, or the Anabatmar. Uh, they were uh, one, one group of, uh, in Wales. You'll also later see Calvinistic Methodists. Uh, Calvinistic Methodists uh, grew up within the framework originally of the Church of England, and then split away, just like Wesley did with uh, Wesleyan Methodists. Uh, Wesleyan Methodists were founded by, George, uh, by, by Wesley, and while the uh, Calvinistic Methodists were founded by a man named George Whitfield. Uh, both had a special method for their religion. Uh, one, was, uh, one was Calvinistic and one was not. Uh, the other uh, group which came, so you had both Wesley Methodists and Calvinistic Methodists uh, who were in Wales. And I guess the final uh, religious group which came to the United States which uh, really doesn't have much impact on central New York, were the Mormons. Uh, in, if you go to hear about the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, uh, they originally were, many, many of them were Welsh, uh, who began singing as they went across the United States towards Salt Lake City. And in fact, uh, there are a number of Welsh settlements out in Utah and Idaho, uh, including one called uh, Malad, uh, which is in Oneida County, Idaho, uh, which is very strong Welsh connections. They were Mormons. The Osmonds, you know, Danny Marie, uh, I won't bring him a song here, but uh, they, they, uh, their mother was a Davies, uh, and they were Welsh Mormons. So uh, that's another, another religious group. Didn't come to central New York, but uh, are important in the, the Welsh story. The, the Welsh uh, uh, came to, to the colonial Pennsylvania and uh, continued to settle there uh, throughout the colonial times. Uh, when, after the Revolutionary War was concluded, uh, there was a, a, immigration began anew to the United States. It sort of stopped during the war, uh, but after the war was over, uh, land was opening up and people uh, were coming to the United States. Uh, the initial uh, immigration to the United States from uh, Wales went to Pennsylvania, and they would come to uh, the Port of Philadelphia, and many went to the old uh, colonial churches that were there, but also many wanted to set up their own settlement. And so they would went out into western Pennsylvania, uh, Cambria County in, uh, is out by Johnstown uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, and that was founded by the Welsh. You see a number of Welsh uh, churches out there. Now, the Welsh came to the United States for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, in uh, Pennsylvania area later on, the, the immigration was because of coal mining, right? Uh, you know, uh, there was lots of coal mining in Wales, and uh, those who wanted to, who were recruited to come to the United States, the coal mine uh, in Wilkesbury and Scranton and other coal mining areas of uh, Pennsylvania. 
Another uh, group of uh, Welsh people came from the, uh, the North Wales slate quarries. Uh, they were skilled in doing slate mining in Wales. They came to the slate areas uh, in the United States, uh, such as up in uh, Vermont uh, and in places in Pennsylvania. So where there is slate mining, people from slate mining places came to those areas. People to central New York, we don't have any coal mines. We don't have any slate mines. We've got bad farmland, and the Welsh were used to that. Uh, so uh, the people that came from uh, came from Wales to central New York were, were most frequently from North Wales and were farmers. Um, I have been back to the ancestral hovel in, in Wales. Uh, I don't have a castle in my past. Uh, but if you go back to the ancestral hovel, there, the house was two rooms, lovely view, uh, but it had two rooms, uh, which I think was divided by a curtain, uh, and they had ten kids. Okay? Uh, this could be a reason why my family came to the United States. Uh, but there were a lot of bad harvests over in Wales, uh, and this caused uh, you know, people to look elsewhere uh, so that they could do their, do their farming. The, uh, <clears throat> the other reason why the Welsh came uh, was sort of a, maybe a little backwards from what you would think. Uh, the Welsh, um, as I mentioned before, uh, were sort of very anti-English, the English were very anti-Welsh, and there was a lot of pressure uh, in, in Wales to conform uh, to speak English. Uh, the Welsh, there was a, a, a report given to Parliament saying that uh, the reason for poverty in Wales was because of the Welsh language, they would never amount to anything if they continued to speak the language. And so there was a, a very strong campaign in Wales to get people to stop speaking the old language. Uh, and this, this involves things such as the Welsh knot, where you put, put a thing around the kids, you call the kids speaking English at, at school, you put the, you wear something around your neck until that kid heard somebody else speaking English and they gave it to them, and whoever had it at the end of the day got paddled. You know, so it was, it was, uh, it was, they were really trying to get Welsh out of society. Uh, the, the Welsh also had a, um, a strong feeling of, of destiny. Uh, they were, uh, we talked about the religious groups, and they were uh, greatly inspired by uh, revivalism and uh, the incoming of new religious fervor uh, in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, and this was, this was, in a way, combined with a sense of Welsh nationalism, uh, where they where they referred to uh, speaking Welsh as speaking the language of heaven, and they, they actually in some sense believed that uh, they they felt that uh, that they were they wanted to preserve their heritage uh, that they felt specially called by God and uh, to preserve their heritage and their language uh, the worst place they could do that was actually in Wales but they, they had England pushing on them. And what a better idea is to find a new place to settle uh, so that they could uh, practice their religion as they wanted and that they could speak their language as they wanted and uh, be uh, together. So you'll see lots of Welsh settlements where the uh, majority of the people in the area were uh, Welsh. The, uh, and so and this, this, uh, this was a, a common uh, desire of the Welsh, which was culminated actually in Welsh moving to Argent, uh, setting up a colony in Argentina, uh, where they could be about as far from the English as possible, uh, and where they could, and, and today there are still uh, schools down there where they teach uh, Welsh in primary school, and uh, they do lots of things in bilingual between Welsh and Spanish. So, uh, but here in central New York, uh, the Welsh started coming here in about the 1790s. Uh, and they came here uh, in no small part because of Baron Stubet. Uh, you may remember Baron Stubet. He was the, the, the man who was kicked out of the Prussian army for being gay, came over to the United States, tra trained, uh, trained the troops for Washington, uh, and afterwards uh, was awarded some land and, and gratitude by New York State. Where did they give him land? They gave it to him up in Stubet, New York. I don't know how great of a prize that was, but that's, that's what they did. 
Uh, and so he built, he built his, uh, his cabin up there, uh, but never really got to enjoy the land. Uh, he died and left his estate to be administered by his aide de camp. Um, one of those, one of the people in charge of the estate was a man named Benjamin Walker. Benjamin Walker also was involved in the Port Authority in New York City and uh, enticed some Welsh people when they came off the boat that wouldn't it be a good idea if they settled in some land north of Utica or north of Fort Schuyler. So the group of Welsh men came up, came up the Hudson, came over the Mohawk, uh, came to Utica. Uh, it took them four days to get up to Stuben. There was no Route 12 or anything like that. Uh, they went up to, uh, up, up to Stuben. Uh, there were a small uh, settlement of uh, English speakers up there, but they found that this would be a good place where they could be by themselves, have their own, uh, own society, and, and uh, be by themselves. Um, and so the Welsh, and this happened in the late 18th, uh, 18th century, uh, right at the turn of the century, and pretty soon people started coming to Stuben. Uh, they they built, a, built a church there uh, called Capital Echo, which is the, was the upper church, a uh, congregational church. Later they built a Baptist church, uh, Capital Islaf, which was the lower church. Uh, and began to come starting in the Stuben area and then branching out to Remsen and then moving out. Uh, and those were uh, mostly farmers. Uh, you also had an influx of people into Utica, the people that worked within the city, and so you had a, uh, a very strong Welsh community in Utica itself. Uh, Utica, uh, Welsh were uh, initially centered in the, what's called the Second Ward. Uh, that's the area sort of down by the, uh, by the Odd, that area. Uh, it's uh, not much left of, of anything there today, but that's where the Welsh, Welsh were before they moved out and moved up to Cornhill, uh, and then moved out to the suburbs. Uh, but that was sort of the, uh, the, the nature of the Welsh. One time in the second ward of, of Utica, there were 75 people named John Jones. Okay, so you had a lot of Welsh people. So uh, what I thought I'd do is I would show you, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, there are lots of uh, places around uh, where there are uh, cemeteries and, and buildings. And I thought I'd just take a few minutes to share with you some pictures of uh, Welsh uh, chapels, which are still standing today. Uh, and. Uh, these are recent photos. I took them out there within the last week or two uh, in the midst of snowstorms and stuff like that. I wasn't sure why I put it off so long. But uh, the, the first place here uh, is the Stone Meeting House in Remsen. Uh, this is now the Historical Society uh, for Remsen, New York. And this was, uh, if you, there's, a, there's a plaque at the top which, which refers to this as a Whitfield Methodist Church which means it was a Calvinistic Methodist church. And this was the center of the Calvinistic Methodists up in uh, the Remsen Stuben area. The first, uh, the first church uh, by the Calvinistic Methodists in the Remsen Stuben area is now gone. It was, it was a place called Penny Pirate, uh, which if you go back to uh, North Wales, uh, to the little town of Abadar, where my family is from, there is a church with the exact same name. That's because a lot of the people from that town came over and started the church. That was the first Calvinistic Methodist church in the United States, built up there in, in Remsen, uh, which was torn down. Uh, it, was, it, it went out of business sometime around uh, 1900. It was used uh, for occasional services for about 10, 15 years. And somewhere around the 1920s, it was torn. It was it was moved. It wasn't torn down. It was moved. Um, interestingly, uh, Dr. Francis. Remember Dr. Francis Dennis? Okay, I, I had my teeth in there many times. Uh, and Dr. Francis uh, was his family was from Abadar, and uh, his his family also his father and he grew up up in the Renson area. His father bought that original Welsh church and moved into his house where they used to his garage. And he told me that his father used to always say that they were driving, driving into church uh, every time they, they pulled into their, their garage. Um, so uh, this, this church here 
uh, was, uh, as I said, was a Calvinistic Methodist Church. Later, the Calvinistic Methodist Church merged with the Presbyterian Church and was a Presbyterian Church for many years. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, by the 1980s, it had federated with the Baptist Church. Both, church, both congregations were sort of dwindling. Uh, there was a decision had to be made as to which church to repair, uh, the Baptist Church in town or the Old Style Meeting House. The Baptists went ahead and ordered the material uh, to repair their church, leaving the four Presbyterians sort of out in the cold. Uh, they decided to close down the church, and they turned it over to the Winston Sudan Historical Society. It's a great historical society, lots of, uh, lots of good uh, documents, books, uh, things like that. Uh, on the second floor, they have uh, events there during the year, including during the Barn Festival, they have a Welsh Crusade uh, every year at 2.30 on Sunday. So, uh, well worth, well worth going there. <clears throat> this little place is called the French Road Church. Uh, it is in absolutely the middle of nowhere. Okay? And as, you're tra as you travel up the Route 12, uh, make, a, make a left on East Tibet Road, and you go a couple miles, and there it is. Uh, this little church was founded in, back in the 1830s, or 1820s. It was founded, they built the church in the 1830s. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was used until about, oh, uh, 1915, 1920, something like that, when it closed. Uh, it was eventually, the building was bought by a New York City attorney who had actually grown up in uh, the Renson area. He preserved the building, then again it fell into disrepair until about 1960 when a man named Creedle bought the, bought the building uh, with a not-for-profit organization called the French Road, uh, French Road Cemetery Association, and they own, own the building. A nice cemetery behind there. Uh, they're, still in, they're still in business, I know, because they called me on Friday because they lost their bylaws, the energy bylaws. Uh, the, uh, every summer they have a Welsh hymn sing there, third uh, Sunday of July at 3 o'clock. And uh, they, they get people, it's, it's gotten smaller in the last couple of years, but they used to have people coming all the way from Canada down for this little, uh, little, uh, uh, little church with their celebration every year. This church is located over in Remsen. It's called Capel and State. Uh, in the, the Welsh, they have a, 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 a letter which is the double L, which involves lots of stick. So it is it is uh, Ensley, uh, and it is named for an island which is located uh, off the coast of Wales. It's uh, within sight of my ancestral home. Uh, it is a uh, they have about six six houses on the on the island and a church, um, and uh, it's presently. People can rent out the cottages in the summer. Uh, it is also it was famous because 20,000 Celtic saints are apparently buried on the island. It's a great place of pilgrimage. And the people who came from that area uh, settled in the Remsen area and built this little church. Uh, it's, it has a, on the side now, it has a picture of the island uh, back in Wales. And <clears throat> There's the front of the church with the Welsh Prague. You'll notice the front of the church uh, is probably wider than the depth of the church. This is because they started out building the front of the church, built the front, realized that they were too ambitious, and built, built the rest much smaller. So it's sort of an odd-shaped church. Uh, and the, this church was uh, active until about the 19, oh, 1920s. Then it was it sort of fallen, uh, fallen out of favor. My great grandfather came in there and was a lay pastor, revived the church, uh, and it continued on until about the about 1966. Um, it uh, generally only had services in the summer. They would start having their, their service with their out to pastor service in May, and they would they would close up shop uh, sometime in the fall with back to the barn service, and uh, that was it. They always had their services in the afternoon and relied upon uh, other ministers in the area to, uh, to be there. The, uh, the church uh, closed in 1966. In 1980, uh, the Presbyterian decided to uh, have the structure torn down. They were unsuccessful because 
In fact, the church was not on land which the church owned. It was owned actually by a neighboring farmer who was not allowed, would not allow them to tear the church down, but instead turned the property over to the Renaissance Stupendous Historical Society, uh, where they, they now have uh, one service every year, the Optic Pastor Service, which is held uh, in May. Uh, and it is an absolutely cute little, cute little church inside. They fixed it up very nicely. Um, and uh, it's uh, well worth seeing. If you see the ad for it in the paper in May, go up there and check it out. Uh, usually, uh, uh, they have some of the people from Cincinnati Creek, uh, Bluegrass Band, people worship there with, with singing, and it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Where's that located? That's located on Fairchild Road in Renston. Uh, so you go past the Fairchild Road Cemetery, just keep going, you go past Walsh District Road, there it is. It used to, it used to be a, uh, a restaurant right next door called Nero's Cafe, I think. And it's, it's right, right down that way. <clears throat> In downtown Remsen, uh, there is a, uh, a marker uh, for, uh, which celebrates a man named uh, Morris Roberts. Uh, he was the pastor of the Congregational Church, the Penniel Congregational Church, which is uh, pictured in the back. You see right in the back, there's a church back there. Uh, Roberts, uh, Roberts was originally a uh, pastor at the Capel Care in, in uh, Madison. Now, the, the, the pastors in, in, in uh, those days uh, they were not being paid very well. They, the first minister at the at Stone Meeting House, used to uh, do the sermon of French Road and a couple other churches, and also Utica. And he would walk to Utica. Uh, the, fourth, the fourth Sunday, he would walk to Utica. He got paid a dollar. Okay? Uh, up in Remsen, uh, they, some of the places uh, were, they didn't pay very well, including French Road you just saw, they paid 25 cents a Sunday. Um, <clears throat> Uh, he, he started his ministry at age 24. He died at age 34 uh, of exhaustion, I think. Uh, and so he was replaced by this guy named uh, uh, Morris Roberts. Morris Roberts came to the, the Church of Remsen. He went out, uh, left uh, Remsen to do a fundraising so they could raise money for, for the cause in Remsen, to raise money for the buildings and stuff like that. Uh, went around to other Welsh communities in the, in around the United States raised a lot of money, came back, discovered that he had been replaced as a pastor by somebody else. Um, so he left the Calvinistic Methodist and went and preached for the Congregational uh, Church. And so he was he was honored by the stone. If you're ever up at the uh, Remsen Barn Festival walking along, you'll see that stone there and you'll walk right by it. But it's, it's an honor of him uh, for the church which is located behind. Uh, this church back here uh, was uh, in existence until 1944. Uh, it owed, they always spoke Welsh there, um, and they never never turned over to English. And um, after it closed, it became the local range. Then it was the parish house for St. Anne's Parish, which is a Catholic church out of Hinkley. Uh, and then uh, they, have, they have subsequently uh, stopped using it or closed. And so I'm not sure what it's used for today. I don't know if there are apartments in there or what. But that is that's still standing on Main Street in Remsen. Uh, that, that was the first congregational church. This is the second congregational church of Remsen. Uh, and it is located off of Route 12. Uh, you've probably passed it a million times on your way to way up north. Uh, on here, Alder Creek. Uh, this is the Bethel Church. Uh, love the church inside. It's got all sorts of uh, pine paneling inside, um, and it was uh, utilized until oh, about 1915. After that, they had uh, old home day services uh, every year until about 1980. Uh, I had the, the, the opportunity to preach in there in, in the 80s sometime, uh, and it's just absolutely beautiful inside. Uh, after uh, the 1980s, the people who were uh, the trustees figured they could not continue to maintain the church. Uh, they turned it over to uh, the Remsen Street Historical Society, which seems to collect buildings like some people collect stamps. Uh, when that church closed, but eventually this closed, it was turned into a, to a house. Uh, and so uh, people drive by there every day without knowing what its history is. <coughs> Likewise, this was the Mariah Congregational Church in. Uh, 
in uh, Prospect. This is the only place where I was uh, where I was confronted by someone who I took a picture of the house. I wanted to know, thinking I was a private investigator or something. Uh, in any event, uh, this was the Mariah Congregational Church. Uh, if you look on the left, you can see where the, where the, the door is. That was once a big steeple up there. There used to be a, a, a very large uh, window in the middle of the other side uh, before it was converted to a house in the 1940s. Uh, it, uh, initially, they merged with the congregation, the English-speaking congregational church. Uh, then they federated, uh, federated with the Baptist church in town and then eventually closed. Uh, this was, uh, this is in Prospect. So both of the churches in Prospect are now houses. As is this beautiful building. Uh, this building is in Holland Patton. Uh, Holland Patton, like, uh, and, and quite honestly, every Welsh settlement has at least two churches. There was the chapel you went to and the chapel you didn't go to. Because okay? <laughs> you didn't have that conflict, what's the point? Uh, so, in, in, in uh, Holland Patton, there were three. There was a Baptist congregation, which I don't think they actually had a building. There was a Calvinistic Methodist church, which was located uh, on the road, which uh, goes down uh, on the side of the twin, twin churches. And this church, this church, which was located uh, in the right on the square. Uh, this was a congregational church, um, and they worshipped in Welsh, and they continued to worship in Welsh. Uh, into the 1950s. Uh, uh, Clinton Lloyd uh, from the uh, Mariah Church in, in Utica, uh, whose son Richard is the organist at St. James. Uh, he was probably the last minister there, uh, and uh, services were always in Welsh. They were held in the afternoon and the end uh, to accommodate other ministers' schedules. Uh, and uh, it was uh, eventually uh, the place fell into was to be closed, fell into some disrepair, and then was converted into a private residence, uh, which was uh, owned by Virginia Kelly. Uh, of, uh, and uh, she eventually sold it. It's now owned by, I think, a retired art teacher from Allentown School. Uh, just an absolutely beautiful, beautiful building. Down the street is another was another congregational church. Uh, this is in Barneville. Uh, this uh, this church shared ministers with the church in Howard uh, They It existed until about the turn of the, the century, 1900, when it was bought by uh, a group of Episcopalians. It became St. Andrew's Church for quite a number of years. Uh, and uh, more recently, when the St. Peter's uh, Episcopal Church closed in Howard Patton and merged with St. Andrew's, they formed a new parish and called it St. David's. Uh, the patron saint of Wales. So uh, this is a, you can see they put a nice parish hall on the side of the building, and it is uh, it's very well maintained and still in use as a church. And this, and I'm going to go talk about Utica for a second. Utica uh, was a strong place, uh, a strong uh, Welsh community. Had publishing in Utica. The Welsh uh, language newspapers came out of uh, Utica. Uh, the Drink, which was, was published in Utica for a long time. Uh, the Cambrian was another uh, English language for Welsh paper, which was, which was published uh, in Utica for a long time. In fact, the, the, the grandson of the publisher of the, the Cambrian still happens in my, my law office. Um, this was the Mariah Church, which was built on Park Avenue. Uh, originally, it was a Calvinistic Methodist church located down on Seneca Street in the second ward. Uh, that church uh, existed uh, as the Mariah Church up until about uh, the mid-1800s, uh, uh, 1870s, uh, when it was sold. It was sold to, it became the uh, House of Jacob, it was a synagogue, then it became the House of God, which was a black church, and finally collapsed. Uh, this building uh, it was the home of Mariah. Uh, it, the, the side building was a parish house, which was used, uh, it was built in about 1925. Uh, and Mariah was, was probably one of the largest uh, churches in uh, the Walsh churches. Uh, in, in Utica, they had the, the first uh, building uh, built by a church in Utica was the uh, Walsh Baptist Church, built in 1801. They eventually closed and uh, sold their building, used the money, was built. I used to build the Thorn Chapel, the Tabernacle. There's a little plaque there for that. 
Uh, the other one was Bethesda uh, Congregational Church, located uh, right down the road from Westminster, which uh, fell victim to urban renewal. Uh, they merged with Plymouth Bethesda, located in Amagata Square. Uh, and uh, then you have uh, the uh, Mariah Church. Mariah eventually merged in about 1987 with the Olivet uh, Church, located in Corn Hill, to become Mariah Olivet. Eventually, they, they sold their, uh, their church to a Seventh-day Adventist church. The picture was taken on, on uh, Saturday. Lots of cars in the parking lot and out front for the Seventh-day Adventist. Um, and uh, eventually, Mariah went and worshipped uh, in the chapel at Westminster Church. Um, and only recently uh, decided to merge with uh, Westminster Mariah and all of that. This building over in Corn Hill was the Mariah uh, Sunday School. They, they had a Sunday school for kids in the Corn Hill area, which existed until 1925 when they built a building next to their church. Uh, this is on Miller Street. It's been used by a variety of different uh, uh, denominations over the years. Today, you'll notice there is a large hole in the roof, uh, so it will probably be not used much more often. That is the Mariah Sunday School. <clears throat> this, you may have recognized as Hubble's Office Supply, at least it was for many years. This was uh, one of the few Welsh Wesleyan churches uh, in central New York. It's called the Coke Memorial Church. Uh, it uh, was, uh, uh, as I said, it was a Methodist church uh, and is located right uh, sort of across from Tabernacle Baptist. It was very, uh, it was a small, it was a small church but known for putting out big dinners when they had the Welsh instead from downtown, uh, which they had for like 100 years. This church itself closed in uh, 19, uh, 1918, and it merged with Central Methodist uh, to, to form Central Methodist. It was uh, and, uh, with three other, a total of three churches. And for a, a while, there was a chapel at Central Methodist called uh, the Coke Chapel. Today, it's a mosque the uh, Central Methodist. But uh, this this building is now vacant in disrepair. Uh, but that was Coke Memorial. In New Hartford, uh, some of the Welsh uh, who attended Mariah did not want to keep driving all the way into, into Utica and decided to form their own church in New Hartford. This is located on Pearl Street. Uh, the, the church uh, operated until about the 1940s, and then they began, uh, they allowed the, the soul to build to the Masonic Temple. Uh, they continued to worship there for a while while it was the Masonic Temple. Uh, the Masonic Temple uh, closed. The, few years ago now is a private residence on Pearl Street. This is a lousy picture. Um, and uh, if I hadn't seen someone walking out of the property, I would have snuck around the back and taken the picture. Uh, right in the middle uh, of this, you can see it looks like a barn. It is actually the Frankfurt Hill um, Calvinistic Methodist Church. Um, it's located, uh, uh, Tim and Charlotte Culver own the, own the property now. Uh, and uh, Frankfurt Hill, uh, the, the, the Welsh in, uh, and Mariah didn't think they needed to build a church out there, but somebody thought they did. Raised the money, one guy raised the money all himself, built his church, and uh, was there in Frankfurt Hill for quite a while until the church was moved to become a farm, farm building. Uh, I've been down back in there, and uh, you can see the, the windows, it looks like a, actually looks like a church. It's a farm building. This is at New York Mills. This is a congregational church called Salem Congregational Church. It's right on the, the main street in uh, New York Mills. Uh, and this uh, existed until the 1950s, I believe. Uh, a small little congregational church. Uh, attorney in my office, Justin Mackey, who grew up in that building. It's a house. On Church Road in uh, Marcy is a place called uh, the Salem Church. This was uh, the first uh, congregational church in Deerfield, because it was founded before Marsh was founded. And uh, it was uh, a, used for quite a while, until about 1915. They had old home services for a while, and then it was used for various community activities. Uh, for the last, I don't know, 40 years, it really hasn't been used at all. There's a group, uh, there was a group, at least, of people who were trustees of the building, just kept the building uh, painted. Uh, there it sits, uh, and there's a cemetery next door to it. That is why Church Road is called Church Road in Mercy. <clears throat> this 
is over in Rome. Rome had two churches. Uh, this was the uh, Welsh Presbyterian Church called Bethel. Uh, and it, when it was the Welsh Presbyterian Church, it looked absolutely nothing like it does today. Um, and it was uh, used as the, it was the bigger, bigger of the two Welsh churches in Rome. Uh, my family attended there. My grandfather would play the organ there for a time. Uh, it was closed in about 1972 when the, they merged with First Presbyterian in Rome. Shortly uh, after they decided to close, but before the, the closing actually happened, the building burned in a big fire. Uh, and so it was totally remodeled and was the Knights of Columbus for many years. It is now uh, a Spanish speaking church. Uh, they were very they were very excited. They had, they had Jim Griffith, the family court judge, who was Welsh, come there. They were so excited to have some sort of connection with the past Welsh. Uh, this is the other Welsh church in Rome. This was called uh, the Rehoboth Congregational Church, or Pepelbach, small church. Um, it was um, uh, used until about 1915 when it was sold to a German congregation. That German uh, uh, church uh, eventually merged into the United Church of Christ and is now Trinity UCC. Uh, if you look at the church, it's right, at, uh, right down the street from uh, the exact Court Street. Uh, and at the front of the church, it's a brand new facade, uh, which looks a, a little more um, fancy than you'd expect to see at a Welsh church. Uh, behind it is what, what the, the old church looked like. Uh, and if you actually go inside there, there's a picture of the way the church used to look with a Welsh Sunday school back in uh, the early part of the 20th century. This is an Arisky. Uh, this is a uh, uh, Calvinistic Methodist church there. Uh, it's been a uh, house since about 1936. Uh, lovely Christmas decorations. Uh, and they share their minister, the minister many times with the Cam Roden uh, Presbyterian Church. Uh, Cam Roden, uh, I forget to know where Cam Roden is. There's really nothing in Cam Roden. Cam Roden had two churches. Okay? Uh, they had a Congregational Church and a Calvinistic Methodist Church. Uh, the Calvinistic Methodist Church was sort of small, uh, so they went out, uh, they wanted to compete with the Congregational Church, and they built a church which by all accounts looked identical to the Congregational Church. They, both, they, they looked identical. Uh, <clears throat> the Congregational Church is now long gone. This uh, church was uh, used as a church up until the 1980s, uh, when the building was uh, uh, sold uh, to the uh, Floyd Historical Society. Uh, it still says the Cam Roman Church out there. Uh, it, is, uh, it was a place where back in the 1920s, uh, well, my grandfather was a student at Hamilton. He went up there. They, they had about six people in worship. He sort of revived it uh, and uh, turned, turned the place around. The, the church uh, was then handed over to Emily Griffith's father. Uh, who was a uh, minister there for many years. And he turned it over with one proviso that, that, his, that uh, Reverend Griffith did not preach in Welsh, because the Welsh was not a strong selling point to keep the church going. This, this picture is of Webster Hill. Now let me tell you something. Uh, I, for some reason I had a closing in Car Carthage a week or so ago, and I had to drive through who knows where to get a picture of this place. Uh, Webster Hill is located up north of, uh, it's in the town of Western. It's uh, way up uh, in the middle of absolutely nowhere. There's nothing there. And this, this little, when I took a picture of this place back about 20 years ago from one of my books, uh, there was nothing around that was a little uh, level wide behind it. Uh, it was a small church. Um, it uh, closed in about 1915, but there it says, uh, people who've been in there tell me the wallpaper from the church is still up on the wall inside. Uh, uh, this, this, is, this is the church's good side, okay? okay? Uh, the other side, it doesn't look, look quite as grand as this, but I, and I, I would expect in the next five years we won't have it. This is, uh, coming to the end here, this is in Turin, New York. Uh, this is, uh, was originally an uh, English-speaking Baptist church. The Welsh were, uh, lived up in the hills around Turin. 
where the, where the farmland was really, really, really bad. Um, and some of them moved into town and set up a congregational church here for a while. And it sits on Main Street and it's like a farm. And we come to the end of our pictures. This is all my other ones I took pictures of. This is a, a painting. Uh, one of my wife Kim's consumers, Connie Avery, painted this picture, uh, which is all the more exceptional because she's blind. Uh, and this is a church down in Nelson, New York. Of all of the Welsh churches in central New York, and at one time there was something in like 95, uh, this is the only one which is still really open. It's open every summer. Uh, it's open for worship services on Sunday nights. They get 50 to 60 people. Uh, it's, they have a Welsh hymn sing on the second Sunday of, of uh, September, the Welsh Day, followed by Welsh parties downstairs, which makes it worthwhile. quiet. Um, and uh, this is uh, it's, it's a, just an absolutely beautiful building uh, and well worth the trip over to Nelson. The reason I have, uh, I finish up with this, the uh, reason I have a picture of a painting uh, is <clears throat> let you know that I have a painting of the, the church in Nelson. A number of years ago, I did a talk just like this to some lovely people from the, the Nelson Historical, or, or Madison County Historical Society, which was meeting at Nelson. And while they were there, they were raffling off a picture, a painting of the church. Very beautiful, beautiful picture. I gave my talk, sold a few books, came home. A day or two later, I got a call from someone and said, well, what happened to the picture? Well, I don't know what happened to the picture. Well, I think someone saw you taking the picture. <laughs> I don't know. So what would you do? I said, well, I, I put something in your in your newsletter saying, you know, please return the picture. No questions asked. No questions asked. Mm -hmm. So the guy. The guy was convinced I stole the picture. So this is to let you know that I have, in fact, they have my own picture of the Nelson Church, and I have not stolen it from anyone. <laughs> uh, so that, 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 there is your brief overview of the Welsh of Central New York, and I will open it up to any questions uh, that I can. Yes? Were your uh, Welsh ancestors in Wales persecuted as much uh, as my Irish ancestors in Ireland? No one can be persecuted as much as the Irish. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, there was, there was persecution against Welsh people speaking Welsh, and that was that was the primary thing. Uh, you know, it is basically, I, I, it's not so much persecution as the benign neglect of Wales. It's the same thing about speaking Irish in Ireland. Right. They're just getting back to it now. Right. right. Yeah. Yes? I was supposed to English, I didn't like the Welsh first month of the they were jealous. <laughs> well, you know, you know, the, the English, the English, uh, they, they came, they invaded, they, they pushed the Britons out, and they, they basically thought of, of the Welsh and the Irish and the Cornish and the Scottish as sort of being, you know, the barbarians who they had pushed away. That, that's basically, you know, that, that's basically it. Other questions? Was there a Walsh Church in Clinton? Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, was there a Walsh Church in Clinton? Yes, there was. Uh, there was a small group, if you could, uh, look, saw an ad in the Clinton Courier for the Walsh Church, which was located where my building, my office is now. Uh, it was on the second floor uh, in the Hops, the Hops Association office. Because um, a lot of people were, were, were Hops, Hops sellers. Um, the, uh, which, is, which is interesting because there, was, there should have been a picture of the Waterville Church, which was in here. Uh, there was a church. There's a church down in Waterville as well, where they had a, um, uh, which became the village hall for many years. That was the Walsh Church, where the pastor was extremely anti-hops when many of the parishioners were growing hops. But it was over there, and uh, there was a ad in the courier saying uh, that there was going to be a special benefit for to benefit the church. Of the Methodist Church. That's all I know about. <laughs> Any other questions? 
Well, I want to tell you, thank you for, for listening to me. Uh, if you're interested in anything about the Welsh in America and their churches, or the Welsh in Central New York and their churches, I wrote two books on that, which I am trying to get rid of. Uh, so, you know, I, and whatever, whatever it says the price is on the book, don't worry about it. Uh, they're, they're, they're there for a donation. So, uh, I have uh, Memory Stones, which is Welsh Churches of Central New York, and uh, that I have Songs and Phrases, which is Welsh churches outside of Britain, which includes the United States, Canada, Australia, and Argentina. There you go. Thank you.